Hello, my name is Mike Roden. I'm a professional fly fishing instructor and river guide. Uh, today we're going to be looking at float tubing and float tubing techniques. Uh, I'm a member of the British Float Tube Association and I spend an awful lot of time float tubing. It's one of my really kind of my own personal fishing leisure activities. It's great fun and I hope you enjoy it and I hope you have a go. Float tubing itself is, it is great because it, it makes all the water accessible to you and it gives you a presentation of the fly that is completely different from bank fishing for example or even boat fishing. We've got here a fairly standard tube. This particular one is called a V-hull. Mm -hmm. okay. um, it's kind of the Mark III version if you like of, of, of float tubes. Uh, when float tubes first came out they were complete donuts. Yeah. Uh, they were just a, a lorry in a tube basically with a, a cover on. Um, and then they went to a horseshoe with just an open end. Yeah. Um, and then this is kind of, say, the Mark III version with the V-hull. The V-hull enables you to just manoeuvre it a little bit better, cuts into the water when you're finning backwards. Um, there's even a Mark IV version now, which are called pontoon boats, really. Right. They're, they're kind of a, a lot more structure in them. Some of them can be metal frames, um, and they're basically just like a catamaran, two big bladders on either side. The advantage of a pontoon is they, they tend to keep you out of the water a little bit, so you're not sat in the water, so you can you know, keep uh, a little bit warmer yeah. uh, at times. Um, but because you are out of the water a bit, they do attract the wind a little bit more, so they can blow you off. I tend to kind of stick with this, really. There's no real reason for me to change this uh, style. You're low in the water, therefore you, know, you can manoeuvre them quite a bit. As you can see, they're made up of uh, bladders. In this case, there's five different bladders. Right. Um, you get different qualities of tube and that is dictated by the thickness and strength of the bladder and also the, the thickness and uh, strength of the Kodura uh, cover. Um, these are kind of mid-range kind of uh, a tube, you know, that you can pick these up for now 100 quid or more, you know, and, and uh, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, what I normally do, um, these particular valves are like um, uh, life jacket valves yeah. uh, that you get on airplanes and stuff. Uh, the one-way valve, uh, they're specifically made so that you can blow them up, uh, but I've got a little bit of asthma. Yeah. It's not going to trouble us when we get out in the water, honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to expire in a, a fit of coughing, hopefully. Um, so what I do just to make it easier is use a, a, just an electric motor, plug into the cigarette lighter, yeah. blow them up to a certain extent and then really finish them by, uh, by mouth. You've got three main bladders. Uh, one on either arm and then one at the back. They're the main pieces of flotation. The other two bladders, which are here, are just really a backrest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you want these blown up fairly uh, uh, comfortably. Yeah. Okay. And um, just to give you a real life experience, I've left this one for you to actually have a go <laughs> yourself. Okay. So this particular inlet here is for the main piece here. Right. All you basically do is blow that up until you literally cannot get any more air in. So, we've got one tube that's ready for action. Now, if we just explain about how the tube actually works. Obviously, it sits in the water just like that. Yep. You're sat there, your legs are dangling down. Yep. You've got various straps. These two straps here are just literally so you can put it on your back if you need to go on a bit of a hike to get right. to your water. Um, other, all of the straps, um, these straps here, the ones on the side, handles are just really for attaching any accessories that you've got, putting in a spare rod, attaching your landing net um, and then you've got any number of storage compartments, uh, big ones for flies, smaller ones for maybe leader material um, etc. The only thing you need to be aware of is obviously scissors, forceps, anything that's sharp for obvious reasons, uh, you don't want them rattling about but you've got loads and loads of storage space. Um, all at hand um, and then this contraption here is just velcroed in you sit in attach this basically is a dual purpose um, it does hold you in to some extent yeah. but you're not going to fall out of it anyway yeah. trust me um, so this really is uh, a line tray yeah. and it's also um, an unhooking mat okay yeah, yeah. so th that's the makeup really of a, a, a normal tube they're fairly straightforward. Um, you've got three bladders in this particular one. Uh, you'd be extremely unlucky if you got a puncture in all three. Yeah. 
Um, if you do, you're going to get wet, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you get a puncture in one, you're going to tilt a little bit, but you're still going to be able to manoeuvre it to some extent, or at least to be able to get to the bank to get yeah. out. If you have a puncture in two of them, again, you are going to get wet, but the third one is, if yeah. you grab hold of it, is going to keep you afloat, okay. okay? But we are going to be using life vests anyway. Yeah. Clothing. Um, obviously, you want to wear chest waders. vast majority of guys that are float tube fanatics and go out every week will almost certainly wear neoprene chest waders because they're the warmest uh, waders we can get. My own personal preference uh, are just really breathables because I can just alter the amount of clothing I've got underneath there from kind of fleecy jump pants to um, uh, thermals etc. So I'm more comfortable using breathables but whichever you choose obviously just really remain warm. The difference between the two ch types of chest waders obviously we can get stocking foot waders and we can get boot foot waders. If you have boot foot waders, then you need specific boot foot fins or flippers as people call them um, in order to fit over the boot. And they're fairly short stubby things that really don't give you a lot of propulsion. So again, my preference is, and most people's I would guess, is to go for stocking foot where you can get proper dive fins that uh, are much, much bigger and are going to displace a lot more water when you're actually finning. Uh, which will give you a lot more control and a lot more speed should you need it when you're out on the water. The key factor is that I found when I'm teaching people uh, float tubing is they can be too ambitious. They can go out float tubing and however far you fin, you must remember that you've got to fin your way back. And it's surprising how many times that fatigue sets in and worse still, it's an unusual method of finning. It's like almost like pedalling a bike backwards. If you're not used to that movement, you're much better off doing it in very short bursts, half an hour, uh, 40 minutes at a time, and then having a rest as opposed to going out and being over ambitious. Because if you get cramp in your legs or your toes, your ankle, then it's absolute agony because there is no respite from it until you get back onto the bank. In terms of the float tube itself, it's inherently quite a safe vehicle. Um, most tubes uh, are multi-bladdered uh, multi so that if you get a puncture in one bladder you've still got maybe two other bladders that are going to keep you afloat, albeit you're going to tilt a little bit, that will enable you to get back to shore. So you're never really kind of going to go down um, with a sinking ship, it's just not going to happen when you float tubing because you'd be extremely unlucky if all your main bladders punctured at the same time, I mean it would have to be fairly catastrophic. The other safety aspects are obviously more to do with the wind when you're actually operating the um, out in the tube itself. You always need to be aware of the wind because it's going to drive you into a bank. You need to avoid anywhere that is very, very rocky so you don't get punctures that way. And that you've got um, uh, the ability to get in and out of the tube uh, should you need to in, an, in, in a hurry or in an emergency. Really stead straightforward, if you just use your common sense, don't get over ambitious, wear the right gear, keep warm and just do you know, 20 to 40 minutes at a time, don't be over ambitious and you'll have a great day's fishing. Float tubing used to be available at, at lots and lots of different commercial fisheries but the key is always check with the fishery first because uh, you need to check that they haven't changed the rules on, on their uh, float tubing policy and almost certainly you'll need to book in advance because there is a limit as to how many tubes they'll allow on the water at any one time. What do you think about float tubing up to now? Really good, really interesting. Good fun isn't it? Yeah, lot yeah. to learn but uh, Absolutely. very enjoyable. I feel safe? Oh definitely, yeah. yeah completely. Okay, well you've had one fish up to now, good start. Let's yeah. see if we can get a few more. Okay. Well done. <laughs>